Hi everyone, my name is Rob Canzanieri, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the Data Architecture Chapter for uh, PASS. And um, if you ever want to email me, you can get me at rob at sqltigers or www.sqltigers.com. I'll uh, be glad to uh, email y'all, talk to y'all. If there's a topic y'all want to hear about, please let me know. If you want to talk to the chapter, just let me know. I mean, I'm sure we can get you on. Um, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, today, we have Mike McGee, and um, he's going to be presenting, and um, thank him for doing that today. Um, of course, you know my personal cell phone would go off. Let me silence that, so it won't bug you guys. Uh, okay, so I would really like to thank our sponsor, Nutanix. They're making all this possible. They're uh, working with PASS, and um, if you have any questions, here's a great link. Click on the link. Learn more about the company, um, and they, they, thank y'all. So upcoming meetings, like so, we got a whole bunch of great meetings upcoming. I got John talking on table partitioning. Uh, Brian's going to come in and talk about integrating R. Uh, Kimberly Tripp's going to be talking about database design and architecture. Um, Tim's going to talk about tuning SQL and how to architect that into your systems. And tonight, um, I was asked. It was kind of last minute, I guess, about two, three days ago, to go on and talk for the local SQL Server uh, PASS community chapter in Baton Rouge. So if you're in Baton Rouge tonight at 6 p.m. at the technology part, come on over. I'm going to be talking about optimizing backups and what I did to make them go really, really fast. Uh, there's some tricks and tips, and uh, I hope uh, some people, a lot of people show up for this meeting. I know not everybody's in Louisiana, but, you know, if you're here, come on over. PASS has a lot of virtual chapters. Uh, Here's a list of them, and I like to, you know, if, if there's something that you're interested in, like architecture or administration, I mean, just log in the past, join the chapter. Obviously, you may have joined this chapter, and they always have a meeting. So lots of meetings going on every month. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike. So, Mike, can you hear me? I can. Great. Let me, um, let me show my screen here. I really appreciate everyone, everyone joining. Robert, if you give me an AOK -okay when you can see my screen, I'll go ahead and. I got it. it. I see. I see your PowerPoint going on. All right, great. So again, I appreciate everyone uh, joining us. Uh, so again, my name is Mike McGee. I'm in the technical marketing uh, department with Mechanix, and uh, what I'm going to talk about are some of uh, SQL Server specific considerations when you're looking at hyperconverged infrastructure and. Um, you know, I, well, I want to keep this as, as generic as possible. And I want to keep it applicable across um, different vendors and, and, and perhaps different architectures tied to hyperconvergence. I really, what, what I'm hoping that you get out of this session is, uh, is a better understanding of, of what we mean by hyperconverged. Um, you know, the size and considerations with, uh, with SQL Server and hyperconverged, and also just how the technology works, uh, and, and a lot of the things you might expect out of a vendor when you um, you know when you look at this mode of deployment because it is it is a bit of a new mode uh, with respect to how you deploy infrastructure underneath underneath your applications. Um, so at a, at a higher level, I think we're all familiar with the uh, the pool um, to the cloud and really pool to um, and, and that's having a flow through and really an impact to the decisions that we make within IT. Um, you know that the cloud offers kind of pay as you go, pay as you grow. Um, so the times of you know doing very large infrastructure pur purchases up front are becoming uh, less and less frequent and, and more few and far between. Um, so one of the things that hyperconvergence uh, helps to bring is fractional consumption. So the ability to uh, grow an environment uh, in, a, in a smaller amount without having to do big iron or, or even forklift kinds of upgrades. Um, another uh, key design aspect to, to hyperconvergence is the fact that it the intelligence is in software and really not in the hardware. Um, to really lower the cost point of running things in your own data center, running thing on, on things on premises, is to try to commoditize as much of the stack as possible, uh, especially from a hardware perspective. And so having intelligence in software uh, with respect to all the features that you might implement is, uh, is important. It helps with speed of innovation. And it helps with uh, ease of use um, and other things. So you know, not being tied to the hardware and using commodity hardware is one of the modes uh, of, 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 of using hyperconvergence. Um, also with hyperconvergence, you'll frequently see it in the context of virtualization. Um, 
most of vendors in this space are going to offer uh, their hyperconverged appliance in some context to, uh, to, to, to VM. So whether it's Hyper-V or uh, KVM, um, Nutanix, we have our own hypervisor called AHV. There's obviously ESXi. Um, so it's a very common mode of combining virtualization with hyperconvergence. Um, and, and we'll get into more details when we say hyperconvergence if you're not familiar with the term or really what it means. Um, uh, but just keep in mind, virtualization is very commonly included or um, something expected as a part of a solution. And because with hyperconvergence, as, as the name implies, you're combining a lot of different roles. Um, you're combining what could be a storage admin, what could be a virtualization admin, a server admin, a, a network admin, into uh, really a common mode of deployment where you're, you're requiring less of specialized IT and more generalized uh, roles. And if, you, if you're a DBA, having a very simplified view of getting access to such an environment where you know if it's if you're really doing software defined hyperconvergence, it should be very easy for an application administrator like a SQL DBA to, to get full visibility into the virtualization layer, into the networking layer, into the storage layer, and even be able to, to make some of the changes and do some self service. So again, matching that cloud model, um, but for on prem, uh, and then further down the line, you know, personally uh, we believe. Um, you know, there's going to be some mode of, of hybrid cloud. Obviously, people are going to move to public cloud, but there's always going to be some some mode for for on-premises. So people are looking for hybrid cloud. Um, so there's solutions at the SQL Server layer, but also at the hyperconvergence layer, um, which could which could help with that journey or help with that balance between what you run on-premises and what you run within the cloud. So those are always those are all important considerations, which are really generic, but they should be what you're looking for with a hyperconverged solution. Um, so I frequently hear common challenges, and, and so I really structured the presentation around the, these types of challenges and how they, they're either similar or maybe differ from traditional infrastructure when it comes to hyperconvergence. Um, so top of the list is, is invariably how do I scale and how well does SQL Server perform? Everyone likes to perform benchmarks to really understand how you size an environment. Frequently with, uh, you know, with storage, you're focusing on IOPS or maybe certain kinds of drive technologies. If you're focusing on virtualization, you, you're considering things like memory over subscription or, or virtual CPU to physical CPU ratios, virtual uh, non-uniform memory access and things along those lines. So understanding these things uh, in, the con in the context of hyperconvergence is something you know, I want to talk about as we go through the present presentation. Um, now I talked about, about virtualization, but obviously a lot of people have physical SQL Server instances still within their environments. Um, so the question of can I virtualize, should I virtualize, or you know, does that hyperconverged solution offer a different mode? Can I access storage directly to a bare metal physical server, or do I have to virtualize to take advantage of the underlying infrastructure? So again, an, an important question and consideration. Also, when you look for um, for virtual for virtualization, uh, cost and licensing comes into play. You know, so am I licensing an entire host? Uh, onto which I'm keeping multiple SQL Server instances. Uh, am I doing per core licensing, uh, which you can do with newer versions of SQL Server, um, so to, almost to reduce your footprint. And a lot of times when you migrate from an existing environment onto maybe newer hardware that's, uh, that's you know, formed based on hyperconvergence, you're going to faster clock speeds, which means maybe you can reduce your core count. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, further, there's always the day two operations when it comes to SQL. I want to maintain uh, my versions. How do I update that in a highly available way? Um, maybe that involves uh, doing things like VMHA, uh, or, or I should say things more like vMotion or live migration with Hyper-V, having HA so I can move instances around. But also at the same time, I might need high availability at the SQL layer, so either a shared failover cluster instance with shared storage, always on availability group, so does that hyperconverged solution offer me that capability that I can do seamless migration and have HA even at a higher level within the stack? And finally, disaster recovery. So there's a lot of base functionality within SQL that allows you to enhance DR, uh, always on availability groups or database mirroring with previous versions, um, even going back to log shipping. And some people will even do uh, a transactional replication um, to, to do some form of DR. Uh, depending on the mode and, and, and the requirements. So we'll touch a little bit on that as well. The hyperconverged solution, again, if it's software-defined, could very well help you with that, with that journey to help with DR as well. 
So just to level set and make sure everyone understands what we understands what we talk about um, when we're talking about hyperconverged infrastructure. Um, if you look at most environments, traditional environments, you will generally have uh, a traditional storage array, uh, which in you know in many cases is a dual uh, storage controller type architecture. You would have a SAN, a storage area network, um, so you know some fiber channel switching that you would have to connect to your servers. In those servers, you'd have uh, fiber channel H HBAs, maybe FCOE, maybe even iSCSI, and then the servers themselves. Um, so what hyperconvergence brings as a base is a combination of including the server um, and, and the storage contained within the, the appliance or within the server itself. Um, so to just, so just imagine taking the, the, the storage within a server combining those servers together into one logical uh, storage pool and then basically eliminating the need to have a storage area network or separate storage arrays. You're basically using software to combine all the storage local to servers, then combining those servers into a virtualized cluster and also a virtualized storage cluster to really combine all those resources. So really getting the benefits of shared storage but with local storage within each server. Uh, and, and what you see here is a, is a is a combination, if you will, of servers within uh, what you know some many people may call a chassis or or a block. And uh, you know one of the key benefits of, of hyperconvergence is it's going to reduce your your footprint, as you can imagine. If you're eliminating additional storage networking, if you're eliminating storage controllers and storage arrays and disk shelves, um, etc., and combining that within the server. You know, in here, for example, you have four servers within a 2U appliance, and in many cases, that's small enough to, to create a hyperconverged cluster. So a very, very small form factor, very, very efficient, really reduces your, um, your power requirements, your cooling requirements, your data center, data center space requirements. Very frequently, you're taking possibly racks of equipment and reducing it down to half a rack or even less. I mean, we're seeing reductions in footprint up to 90%. Um, so even independent of the application that you run, we're obviously focusing on SQL, there's a lot of core benefits to hyperconvergence from ease of use, but also just the raw footprint, both from power cooling uh, and data center space that you, would, that, you, that you might utilize. Further, I talked about incremental scale, so the ability to, to, to expand out. Um, so it's very, very simple. It should be based on adding an additional server and the, the storage associated with that server to allow you to grow the environment. So not adding an entire storage array or a whole disk, disk shelf or anything along those lines. Um, growing within hyperconvergence should be, should be very simple. So you can start small and as you grow, incrementally scale. So really matching that, that, cloud, um, that cloud experience. And further, like I said, virtualization should be uh, a part of the experience. Um, and and you know, really, you should have choice within that, within that stack. Um, so whether you're looking at Hyper-V with SQL Server or ESXi, which is very common, um, or, or even you know maybe open source styles of uh, of hypervisors if you're looking to avoid some form of uh, of licensing associated with the hypervisor itself. So I talked about expansion flexibility. Um, so one thing to consider when looking at hyper hyperconvergence and it's a pretty common question is you know okay great you're giving me all my storage and my compute and memory within a server but what if I just need storage? What if I don't want to grow, like, you know, my SQL Server instance is fine, it's got enough memory, it's got enough CPU, I just need additional storage. Um, so if I had another node, aren't I adding additional CPU and memory that I'm not going to use? Um, so, you, so if you're looking at hyperconvergence, you need to ensure that you're choosing uh, an option that gives you some flexibility with respect, with respect to expansion. So that could include, because a lot of these are uh, appliance-based, meaning that you're buying a specific uh, server type with a given amount of memory and CPU. Uh, some vendors have a restrictive list on how you can do this. Others are, are, are more open and have a config to order type of model. Um, so that's an important consideration. Uh, also, some of these don't have the notion of storage only. They might be adding memory and compute that could be used by a VM that you may or may not use based on uh, what you add. So having some level of flexibility is important. So if we give you an example in this space. Say you have a three node cluster. It has equal memory and compute. You're running virtual machines on there, running SQL, and you're also consuming storage. So you have an X amount of compute and also X amount of storage. Um, if you then want to expand that by an additional node, like I said, you're adding compute for your VMs, but you're also adding storage at the same time, very linear fashion, a very known amount that you're, that you're going to grow by. Again, that incremental consumption uh, that makes it uh, very flexible and very easy. But if you then want to add just storage, you want to make sure you choose a vendor 
that can just add a storage only or, or storage capable node. So now you're disaggregating the requirement of growing compute at the same time and just adding storage um, for that purpose. So definitely consider um, when you're looking at these, you have the appliance model like I mentioned, but you do have vendors that will give you software only to build your own. Um, that's perfectly fine. That's something you can look at, but just keep in mind when you do buy an appliance model, you are getting a known performance envelope. Um, so that vendor can help you with uh, sizing, how many IOPS you would expect out of the platform, the CPU cycles, how much memory makes sense, and even the memory speed. So you know, an important thing to keep in mind when you build your own is you might have very large SQL instances. They could have uh, 512 gigs of memory, terabytes of memory, I hear. Um, and, and very frequently, when you add the DIMMs, memory DIMMs, large enough within a server, to, to have that kind of density, terabyte or more within a server, you're actually dropping the memory speed. So the memory speed is, is slower, and that'll impact, especially computational workloads that are, that are more CPU and memory intensive as opposed to storage, it can actually slow them down. Um, so if you have an appliance vendor, they're going to know when you hit this, uh, this threshold, whereas build your own, that's something you're going to need to keep in mind. Um, so like I said, it's, in, it's really a known performance envelope. Another key thing to keep in mind is, uh, you know, I just gave you kind of a, a homogeneous way to grow a cluster, add a node, add a node, same compute, same storage. But in some cases, you need flexibility. You might need to add a more storage-dense node where you can still run VMs. You might add something that's more compute-dense with less storage because you have a, a given SQL instance that needs more memory, needs more CPU compared to maybe other nodes. Um, so this comes in the form of heterogeneous clusters. So imagine... Um, you know, just these different nodes within the same cluster with the sh same shared storage, but with different memory CPU, maybe even memory families, or excuse me, CPU families. Um, so that's important to keep in mind is how flexible is it, say, the next version of the Intel TikTok process is out, you get a faster processor, I want to add it to the exact same cluster, and maybe I can move my SQL instance over to it um, and have it run from there, but still take advantage of all the shared storage within that architecture. So. Again, really choosing something to give you that flexibility. Now these hyperconverged solutions um, generally use just Ethernet for back-end connectivity. You don't need fiber channel SAN, um, you know, don't, don't need fiber channel HBAs. You'll generally have 10 gigabit NICs within the servers. All those NICs would go to a top of a rack switch. Very commonly it would be a leaf spine style of, uh, of architecture. Um, and then uh, that, that's how the nodes communicate with themselves and also communicate with external applications and, and really help to drive that, that shared storage pool. Um, so you're really collapsing the stack, but then node connectivity becomes very, very important. Um, you want 10 gigabit non-blocking switches. You don't want to use things like FEX or, or, or network switches that use shared buffers. You really want uh, a high uh, buffer count uh, with respect to kilobytes or me megabytes for that, for that switch vendor. You also want it to be dedicated. You want full line rate 10 gigabit um, connectivity. Now some, some uh, solutions can give you uh, one gigabit as well if it's for maybe smaller scale remote site branch office where you might be running smaller instances. This is something to keep in mind. Um, further, you could use some, um, some, some specific kinds of network connectivity. So some vendors are going to push you to, towards uh, remote direct memory access or RDMA. And there's different forms of that. There's Rope, there's iWarp. Um, Rope, for example, actually has some ties to the kind of switches that you might use. Um, so choosing a vendor that might push you towards RDMA might, might push you to also have to change your top of rack switch so it, so it can account for an RDMA style of, uh, of solution. Um, some uh, hyperconverged vendors might push you towards even proprietary backends or, pro or proprietary uh, networks. Um, so in some cases that might be Fabric Interconnects, uh, you know, which uh, might be Cisco specific in this case. Or there could be, you know, I showed that, that image of a block before. Sometimes there's a shared black backplane as a part of that block or a part of that chassis. Um, so that, that backplane um, acts as an interconnect between the nodes. Sometimes, again, if you're doing build your own, that backplane isn't actually highly available. So if you had an issue with the PCI card that repre represents that backplane, it might take out two or more nodes within that, within that chassis, within that block, which actually could cause uh, unavailability to the solution. So again, this speaks to um, you know, build your own versus an appliance model, and if uh, the appliance model is right, it's going to cater for uh, awareness at the, at, the, at the node level. And then you'll have options which just use commodity 10 gig. And you know, personally, at Danutanix, we feel like this is the best model. 
Um, it's going to we're you know we're fighting with the with uh, with the cloud with, res with respect to where you're going to run SQL Server. We want it to be cost effective, and, and commodity 10 gigabit non-blocking switches helps to offer the simplest solution uh, to uh, you know to interconnectivity with uh, with hyperconvert. Um, so just keep in mind, depending on the technology that you choose, it's going to impact the upfront cost uh, as well as the overall cost with respect to how you operate the environment. Um, it could impact uh, performance. RDMA is going to give you the, the best raw performance uh, out of the box. And whether you, you have some choice to the hardware that you, um, that you choose. I mean, if you're using some kind of shared backplane or fabric interconnects, that might lock you into a specific hardware type or, or a specific vendor, which again, may or may not be what you want, could possibly increase costs. Um, so if we focus on the way in which data is, is written, uh, with hyperconvergence, uh, just about every vendor is doing some form of, of replication factor. Um, you can look at this as mirroring. So, if you're familiar with RAID one, RAID ten type architectures with with storage arrays, you're going to get a, a similar experience. Although, again, if you're focusing on being software defined, you're not tied to the physical constructs of the disks in the cluster or the nodes in the cluster uh, in, 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 a, in a specific way. So, if you want to be able to grow and expand and add additional drives, add additional drives, add additional drives based on adding nodes to a cluster. You can't be tied to RAID sets or to, or to, or to um, specific node counts. So this is why we, we talk about it in the context of replication factor. And you know, at, at a high level, if we focus on the way Nutanix does it, uh, Nutanix does it by, uh, you know, if you have a, get, a given guest or VM running on a node and that virtual machine writes, it's going to write to its local cluster, and it's going to do a replication to a one of the other nodes within the cluster. Um, so that, that's a, a default replication factor of two. Uh, you'll actually have some flexibility in, in, in how you choose this. You can have a replication factor of three, for example, if you want to have that copy replicate to more than just one other node. But just to keep in mind, for, for sizing purposes with SQL, um, for your expectation around redundancy, most will start with a replication factor of two in smaller clusters. Larger clusters, when you start talking 32 nodes or more, you might look at a replication factor of three so you can survive the loss of multiple nodes um, at the same time. And every vendor is going to have a bit of a variant here. Um, like I said, Nutanix always writes locally and to one remote node. We operate based on something we call data locality, uh, which, um, which we'll get into more detail on. So if we focus on uh, resiliency, like I said, most solutions will utilize some form of mirroring. Again, it's not tied to the physical uh, RAID, if you will, or RAID sets. It's going to be more software-based. And some, some options will have two copies. Some will allow you to do two or three copies. Now, comparing that to RAID 5 or RAID 6, where you're looking to get more storage efficiency, where you're not looking to keep a mirror of the data, um, you know, some vendors will offer you erasure coding. and something that Nutanix offers as well. And erasure coding, you can look at as kind of a network RAID, where you're doing a RAID 5 or RAID 6-like parity protection, um, but it's based off that initial two or, or, two or, or three copy initially. Um, so a lot of these solutions, um, so I'll give like specifically for Nutanix, say you have a replication factor of two, you have two copies of the data. As a post-process, we can go through and say, you know what, we're going to create parity across different blocks in the cluster and remove that secondary copy. So now you're starting to get more efficiency than keeping you know 100% or 200% overhead by by maintaining two or three copies. So really adding that RAID 5 or RAID 6 style of data protection to reduce the storage requirements. Now with uh, hyperconvergence all nodes or, or, or all replication is going to be node aware and, and what that means is these solutions need to be able to survive the maintenance on a node and when I say a node that's really a server. So an entire server has to be able to go offline and come back and you have to maintain resiliency within the cluster. Um, important thing to keep in mind with a lot of these solutions is when a node does go down for maintenance, does that system fail fast? So does it start a rebuild process right away, or is there a delay in the rebuild process? Also, do the nodes or the servers have a maintenance mode to prevent or, or give you some kind of control over whether or not a rebuild uh, occurs? Some solutions wait to rebuild. Um, you know, which is okay during maintenance, but not so great if it's a real failure. Um, so uh, so under, understanding that is, uh, is important. But again, all of them will have some form of node awareness where you can lose an entire node or even multiple nodes if you're keeping three copies and doing a RAID 6 style of erasure coding uh, across all the nodes. Um, as a further extension to that, some actually have block or rack awareness. So I showed you 
that picture where you had four servers or really four nodes within a single TU appliance. Um, you could have multiple appliances or multiple blocks, if you will, and you can start applying replication across blocks, so keeping the mirror in a different block as opposed to just another server within the same block. Um, so this adds a lot of flexibility. Sometimes it allows you to specify which rack uh, a given appliance might live in. So if you want to have rack awareness, uh, meaning that if a given rack has a different um, a power back end, if you were to lose that rack, you'd still have a second copy of the data living in another rack. Uh, some of the solutions based on this with hyperconvergence are, are manual, meaning that you need to go in and say, hey, this rack is where I want the secondary copy to live. Others do it automatically. So in Nutanix, we actually do block awareness. If you have enough blocks within a cluster, automatically, so you don't have to so you don't have to think about it or don't have to worry about it. Um, additionally, the way data is replicated with hyperconvergence may or may not be fully distributed across all nodes. Um, so personally, I think the best model is where if you do do a replication factor of two or three, every single node within the cluster is eligible as a target for, for maintaining a mirror or, or main, maintaining another copy of that replication factor of that data. Um, some hyperconverged offerings do it based on objects, and those objects are invariably virtual disks. Um, so you might have a, you could have a 16-node cluster, but a particular virtual disk for your SQL Server instance might only be mirroring across two of the nodes within that 16-node cluster, almost acting like a array as opposed to a true replication factor. Um, so if you do talk to vendors and you look at these kinds of solutions, make sure that you understand the way they distribute the data. Is it based on virtual disks, or is the data truly uh, spread across every node in the cluster so I can um, have more distributed performance and also a better availability? Um, another thing to keep in mind, uh, you know, we have checksums enabled uh, with SQL by default. You also want checksums in your underlying storage. Every major storage vendor that you would expect, um, whether EMC or NetApp or, 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 or others, have, have always had checksums within the underlying storage, within the underlying storage controllers. Um, some hyperconverged vendors, however, haven't implemented or maybe have just implemented checksums, which may or may not be enabled by default. Um, Checksums have a lot of benefit. It's better for the storage to discover if there's bit rot you know, on, a, on a solid state drive or if there's, for some reason, uh, a secondary copy is, is corrupt. You'd much rather find that out with the storage array that can correct it preemptively and keep SQL running versus SQL discovering that it's found a bad checksum and has to um, basically mark that database as suspect and make you do a page level restore if you have an always on availability group or in worst case actually have to do a database restore simply because checksums aren't being, uh, aren't being used within that array, and it couldn't find that error before SQL did. Um, so it's an important consideration. Nutanix, we keep checksums on all the time by default. We don't even give you an option to disable them because they really should be part and parcel to the environment. Um, so all of these considerations together impact uh, the way the network's utilized. So we've talked about the network con connectivity between the nodes, whether you're replicating twice or, or replicating three times. That's going to impact your performance whether you're replicating across nodes or across blocks, and if blocks live in different, uh, uh, in different racks, those could be going across your spine network as opposed to just your top of rack switch. Um, so that's an important thing to keep in mind. And if, if uh, you, know, you do have a failure in an environment, a node fails, a drive fails, how does that rebuild occur? Is it, is it fail fast and immediately rebuild? Is it rebuilding from all of the drives in the cluster? So in parallel, really reducing the time it, it takes to rebuild that, um, that drive, or is it you know, acting more like a RAID scenario where you're rebuilding against, uh, you know, just a subset of the drives, where if you're running SQL against those same drives, you know, you're going to have a bigger impact um, to your performance than if every drive in the cluster is participating in a rebuild operation. So again, hopefully this information is useful for, you know, if you start having these conversations around hyperconvergence. Um, so we talked about writing data, but what about reading data? So obviously writing is going to distribute the data across the nodes. It's going to hit the network and provide resiliency. Um, but what if I read data? Um, so reading data is really going to be dependent on the vendor. Like I mentioned, um, if some are going to mirror data between nodes, that means only those two nodes are going to be the primary source for, for reads uh, and, and writes, uh, as a previous example, for that virtual machine and for that, for that SQL instance. Um, some vendors read from everywhere. So if they, you distribute the data everywhere, you're going to read the data from everywhere. Um, so that it has impacts to the kind of network that you that you might that you might want to use. You might want to use RDMA. Um, you might need a, a, a larger or more uh, spine throughput, uh, especially if you're reading across blocks that might be in different racks. Um, 
at Nutanix, we do something called data locality, and what that means is we uh, attempt to, to read from the local node. We're by no means restricted to reading from a local node. We can read data from any node in the cluster. Uh, but, the, but the idea is that if we can eliminate having to go across the network, it's going to be a some benefit to, to all the nodes within the cluster. Allows more bandwidth for writes. Allows, allows more bandwidth for when a VM does have to read uh, remotely from a different node. So we actually maintain metadata uh, to, 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 den to denote whether or not uh, data is local to a cluster, to a node, or remote to a node within the same cluster. And if it's local and it happens to be running on the same host where that VM resides, that's where we're going to prefer to read that from. So think about things like high throughput requirements with the OLAP or, uh, or a decision support system with SQL Server. The benefit here is you're getting localized read access, so very, very high throughput and very, very low latency. Um, so that's an important consideration uh, as, you, as you look at solutions out there and, and, and as you design. And by the nature of operating based on data locality, it really gives you more flexibility with the overall topology. Um, if you look at traditional, traditional storage, very often if you want to eliminate a noisy neighbor within a shared storage array, you're forced to enable some kind of QoS. So imagine a very large cluster where maybe you have a mix of uh, test and dev, maybe even production on the same cluster. If they're all running on the same storage array, you want to make sure that test and dev isn't impacting your production instance. And now you're forced to enable QoS, um, like limit, limit storage IOPS and do other things that you might not want to do and adds complexity to the overall management. So in a hyperconverged infrastructure, if you're operating based on data locality, you have inherent separation between those nodes. You'd have a test and dev instance that's running on a particular set of nodes. It's localizing its data and reading and writing, um, you know, minimizing the remote writes and, and, and reading locally so that it does not impact your production database um, as much. And so that greatly helps, you know, whether it's an OLTP type uh, application, small block, random operations, uh, you care more about uh, initial response times. You know, you really want low response times. You really want uh, solid state drives within within that configuration. And we'll talk more about that. Most hyperconverged appliances are going to have some form of solid state drive um, that you uh, that that that, that, you, that you'll you'll that you'll use. And there's also a combination of SSD and HDD for hybrid. Um, but but just keep that in mind. If you're localizing data and you're localizing SSD. Um, and if you look to the future in NVMe and, and, uh, and 3D uh, crosspoint, those are super low latency and super high performance. Do you want to be going across a network to retrieve that, some kind of fiber channel backplane, or do you want that localized within, within a node? So there's a lot of benefits to hyperconvergence in that if you can localize the, the I.O., you're going to get the best performance out of those newer drive technologies, the lowest latency for your OLTP application. And then if you look at uh, your, your analytical processing or your decision support, you know, you're talking about maybe higher response times but much higher throughput. Um, so, you know, 500 plus megabytes a second, gigabyte a second, or, or, or even more. So you're going to get that best bus speed type of performance by localizing that I.O. as well. And if you do localize it to a node uh, with a, within a cluster, it's not going to impact the network as much, which is by, by follow through isn't going to impact other applications that might be running within that, that same cluster. So there's a lot of benefits to that. It inherently limits the, the noisy neighbor effect. Now, I mentioned, uh, I mentioned solid state drives and also hard disk drives. So a lot of the solutions that you'll see in the hyperconverged space is going to give you, at a minimum, SSD, whether that be for write caching initially or for a read tier. Some of these solutions for a read tier uh, only use it as a caching layer. Um, so it's important to keep in mind. So if you have a hybrid solution that includes SSD as well as spinning media, hard disk drives, it's important to ask the question, is all of that space available to my application? Are they all available to SQL Server? Or is some of that just a caching layer? And for sizing purposes, is, that not, um, is it not included? Um, so is all that space going to be available for SQL, or, or is it really just a caching layer? And then further, how does, how does tiering work with that solution? If you're SQL Server, and um, you're a high-performance application, you want to be running an SSD. If that application is down-tiered to the HDD tier uh, within the solution, you, you, you may have a performance impact, especially if it's a 7200 RPM drive. Um, so a lot of sizing considerations and actually understanding uh, the real-time tiering that, that can happen within a system is very, very important for SQL because that active data, that hot data that SQL is using, you want that to be running on the the solid state drive tier in, in a lot of these in a lot of these scenarios and a lot of these appliances. You know, SSD prices come down so much 
that having 10K RPM drives, that having 15K RPM drives doesn't really make a lot of sense. They're actually more expensive than just having an all-flash solution. So even though there's hybrid solutions out there with SSD and HDD, we're seeing more and more frequently the entire solution be SSD-based or all-flash. And that's great for SQL because then now you're not questioning what's hot, what's cold. You're not questioning, you know, when's that end-of-month workload, when's that end-of-quarter workload going to hit. Did it the system down tier that data to a slower tier so when I, you know, that does come along, um, am I going to experience a performance impact? Um, so all flash solutions are becoming more and more common um, with hyperconverged mode of, of operating operation, and that's really just because the price of SSD has come down. Um, and again, you'll also start to see NVMe worked into this conversation, and, and further down the down the road, even faster technologies like 3D Crosspoint. So again, how does that define your back end? How does that define your tiering? Um, important questions and things to consider when you're when you're looking at a vendor. All right, so storage efficiency. Now, storage efficiency is, uh, is interesting. Most hyperconverged solutions were born into an age where some form of deduplication, some form of compression, some form of thin provisioning uh, are are required. You know, so so it wasn't it wasn't as if hey, you know, I'd like to have this. You know, I. I Existing storage arrays that, that, that have grown into this kind of environment have kind of had to force in these features, force in the ability to, to do VDU for compression. Um, all of them eventually adopted thin provisioning. Um, but you know, all these efficiencies that you get at the storage layer, they should be within that hyperconverged uh, software-based uh, deployment. You know, and, and, and with that, there's different variants. You know, sometimes you can do uh, compression inline. Sometimes you can do it as a post-process uh, uh, operation, and the same with deduplication. Are you hashing and creating fingerprints in line, or are you doing it as a post process? And specific to, C to uh, SQL Server, um, you know, you have some options. So not only do you have options at the storage layer to, to perform these kinds of operations, you have options at the SQL Server layer. And depending on version, you might even be combining compression and, say, transparent database encryption. So now you're encrypting the, the data as well as compression, cr compressing it before it gets to the storage layer, they may also be trying to compress it, depending on um, you know, what you're using, whether you have flexibility to enable or disable compression at the storage layer, or whether it's on all the time. Um, so, so very frequently, if you're doing compression at a higher layer, say at, at SQL Server, it's going to limit the benefit of doing compression at the, at the storage layer. And again, hyperconverged hyper solutions are likely going to have this capability. Some do, some don't. It's, it's something important to keep in mind. Um, but like, like, um, but like other, uh, you know, other options. Sometimes whether you can do compression is based on licensing. You know, so if you're at an older version of SQL, or if you're at a version of SQL that's uh, standard edition, you might not be able to enable things like trans transparent database encryption or compression. Um, so enabling that or having it available at the storage layer gives you that benefit without having to pay additional SQL Server licensing uh, to enable at the uh, at the SQL Server layer or, or enabling it for a particular table. Um, so depending on the solution, it gives you that much more flexibility. Now, when you look at deduplication with really databases in general, uh, but specifically with SQL Server, deduplication tends to have very limited value um, for, for databases. And, and the reason for that is SQL has a, has a unique page header for any data that's been, that's been written. And finding unique data across all of these you know, uh, uniquely formatted page headers is very difficult for even the best of uh, deduplication engines that are that are out there, for um, you know for running you know your primary workload. You know backup workloads are a little bit different, but for running your primary SQL Server databases, generally you're not going to get a lot of benefits out of uh, out of deduplication. So that's important to keep in mind. So for Nutanix, for example, we would recommend that you enable compression. You even get benefits if you're already doing SQL Server compression. Um, not as much, obviously, if you're doing it at both layers, but there still is a potential for benefit uh, by having it enabled at both layers, incremental, but um, there are still some benefits. So Nutanix, we would recommend compression for SQL Server. We would not recommend uh, deduplication because really you're wasting processing doing a compute hash for something that you're likely not being able to dedupe anyway. Uh, and further, we talked about uh, erasure coding. Again, that's like a RAID 5 or RAID 6. Um, if you're familiar with traditional storage recommendations with RAID 5 and RAID 6, it's generally not recommend, recommended for write heavy workloads because you're, you're, um, you're overwriting existing um, parity, you have to recalculate that parity. It's causing additional reads in the back end. Um, so normally RAID 5 and RAID 6, especially with you know busy SQL Server instances, 
was are, is more recommended towards uh, read heavy workloads as opposed to write heavy workloads. And that applies for erasure coding as well. It's generally recommended for write cold data. Um, so if you know you have archival requirements for SQL Server and there's there's pieces of it that aren't um, that write aren't write heavy. Maybe it's initially write heavy on ingest, but after it's there, you're not updating that data in place very often. You're just keeping it as a means to have a year's worth of records, five years worth of records. You know, maybe an old app environment where you have um, where you have uh, cubes and whatnot. So in that kind of environment, erasure coding could be a benefit to reduce your storage uh, footprint um, based on that write cold to read hot data. And lastly, you know, storage efficiency is counted in different ways. Um, you know, if you're looking at pure storage efficiency, that tends to fall under compression and deduplication and erasure coding. Um, but some people count thin provisioning uh, towards saving space, and, and some people actually count snapshots towards towards saving space. So if you have a, a requirement to create copies of databases for test and dev, um, or, or, or you know, or even other purposes for backup. Using a snapshot can be a means to create an additional logical copy for the purpose of maybe surgical repair. Someone drops a table, someone deletes a database accidentally, they can mount that snapshot and retrieve that data. Um, so, so that's, I look at that more as copy avoidance as opposed to pure storage efficiency, but it really falls under that umbrella as well. Um, so looking for a hyperconverged solution that can give you that kinds of snapshots that you can use with SQL Server for, like I said, backup. Um, for test and dev or, or even for logical uh, corruption as, uh, is important. And again, it's going to help with the overall storage efficiency that, uh, that you're going to have. Um, and so with that, like, like I mentioned, um, creating additional clones of, of virtual machines is something that you should be looking for as a part of the offering. And, and what's cool about hyperconvergence, again, because it's based on virtualization in most cases, you're looking at replicating either a virtual disk or a VM. You're not looking at replicating an entire LUN, where you could have multiple VMs, or multiple disks, or you know more of the bare metal paradigm. Um, so, look, so finding a solution that can um, you know resolve down to the virtual disk layer is important. So it'll give you a lot of flexibility on whether you're just copying a SQL database uh, based on a snapshot, or if you're just you know going to copy and protect an entire server. It helps with ease of use. Um, it helps with um, really simplifying uh, the operations but also giving, them, giving you the granularity uh, that you want to, to spin up uh, VMs for whatever purpose. So what about sizing? Um, so there are some unique considerations when it comes to hyperconvergence. You're, you're sharing um, the, the compute, if you will, with, uh, with the storage layer. Um, so one of the first considerations uh, is the fact that regardless of the solution, there's going to be some additional memory and CPU taken up by the, the storage layer of that hyperconverged solution. Um, different vendors have different modes. Some, some deploy based on a controller virtual machine, so a controller VM that does all the logic around replicating the data and maintaining performance and whatnot. Um, some have internal uh, use, so you might not see uh, a VM running, but, but be sure that that kernel is still taking up resources to um, to replicate that storage, to perform the read operations, etc. So it's important that when you look at a solution, understand the, the core requirements, um, whether it be by default or you know, maybe in unique situations where you need very, very high, high performance where you might up that number. Um, so a very common base uh, for, for sizing would be to assume that four cores out of a system and, and roughly 16 gigabytes of memory would be in use by the storage layer associated with that hyperconverged solution. So that essentially means that those resources you can consider um, not necessarily reserved, but consider them in use for sizing purposes. So that means that they would not be available for the SQL Server instance running on that particular node. So again, this is one of the sizing things that you should take into uh, account. And again, if you're looking at an all SSD con configuration, you know some of the some of these software-defined appliances are going to give you a high performance mode, perhaps, or recommend that you size for more cores because maybe you're doing more IOPS. And again, this is really an extreme scenario where you're talking if I'm doing 50 to 100,000 IOPS, where you might need to consider uh, allocating more cores toward the storage layer, which again would limit how much you'd have available to SQL Server running on that on that same node. Um, like I mentioned before, 
the, the tiering or caching layers associated with, uh, with the solution may or may not in, be included in the total usable storage capacity, capacity excuse me, of the storage pool that you're creating with hyperconvergence. Um, so again, for sizing purposes, it's a, it's good to know. Hey, you know, if I need 10 terabytes of storage for my SQL database, is that 800 gigabyte SSD drive going to be included in that overall storage pool, or is it just a caching layer, meaning that it actually isn't contributing to or or reducing the amount of storage I'm going to need for that one terabyte? So again, something to keep in mind. Um, I talked about hybrid systems. So again, when you when you size, you really want the hot data associated with SQL in that solid state drive tier and not in the spinning media tier. You're going to get your best experience, you're going to get your best um, performance. So in a lot of cases you might just go with all SSD. If it matches your, your budget, if it match, matches your cost point, um, you know, if you, if you feel like you can't have a very good understanding of what's hot and what's cold, if you know you're running transactions that are going to operate against the, an entire table. Um, or, or you know, across multiple tables in the database, and you know that's going to represent a certain size. You want to make sure that size is in the in the SSD tier, especially if you're looking at hybrid models, where there could be some kind of automated tiering occurring between um, between those different uh, storage layers. And then we talked about efficiency. So in some cases, you would want to take storage efficiency into account. So again, if you're not necessarily compressing data at the SQL layer, and you're compressing at the storage layer you may want to assume that you're give, getting a certain uh, data reduction level so that you don't have to oversize the amount of storage that you would need for SQL. The safe way to size is to say, hey, if I need, a, if I need 10 terabytes, I'm going to make sure I have 10 terabytes of storage. But with storage efficiency underneath it, you might be able to reduce that amount to say 1.5 to 1 or something like 2 to 1. That's a relatively safe assumption. Most compression within um, these kinds of appliances and even within storage arrays in general are going to give you some level of efficiency with compression. So if you want to make that assumption, um, you can do that between 1.5 and 2 to 1 is relatively safe. Some vendors will promise you the world. They'll promise you 100 to 1. They'll promise you 50 to 1. I would encourage you not to believe that and to be skeptical. It's likely not going to be the, be the case. And I wouldn't bet a mission-critical SQL Server deployment that needs X amount of space on getting that extreme kind of compression or deduplication ratio. So I would take a very uh, conservative approach, 1.5 to 2 to 1 is, is relatively safe. And the great thing about hyperconvergence is if you do need to grow, you can grow incrementally. You can add in the individual nodes, like, heck, you know, I, I, I didn't do, I, I did 4 to 1 and ended up being 2 to 1. I wanted to be aggressive, but you know what? I want to remediate. How do I remediate? If you can grow just by a single node incrementally, it makes it much easier than if you're dealing with something that's going to cause you to add additional controllers or additional, additional disk shelves or anything along those lines. So I mentioned licensing at the at the opening of the presentation. So how does you know how do these these considerations with hyperconvergence start impacting licensing? Um, so invariably, like I said, it includes virtualization, and virtualization allows you to perhaps take a physical instance of SQL that's running on maybe older CPUs, slower clock speed, and and move that onto a solution that has higher clock speed, maybe give it fewer CPUs, CPUs to really right size that instance, and by doing that. It gives you some flexibility to say, hey, I was licensing an entire server that had uh, you know, 16 cores. I can now run that same server on eight cores, and that ultimately reduces my total license per uh, count with respect to um, SQL Server. Or, alternatively, if you do virtualize coming from bare metal, uh, it gives you the opportunity to license an entire host. Um, so imagine if you have multiple SQL instances, multiple virtual machines, you don't need a one-to-one -one physical CPU to virtual CPU ratio. You can start looking at oversubscribing the CPU. We generally don't recommend oversubscribing memory, but if you wanted to try to oversubscribe memory, you could. But from a licensing perspective, it really comes down to you know, the cores that you're licensing. Um, so if you have a test dev environment that's physical today, virtualizing it is going to give you a bunch of benefits, especially if you oversubscribe the CPU. All you would have to do is license that host, and you can get additional density additional virtual machines on that on that platform. Um, the addition of the um, of the SQL server that you're running is also important. Um, for example, if you're running uh, you know enterprise edition so that you can do failover clustering just for the purposes of HA, you might be able to get HA at the virtualization layer instead. Um, and we'll we'll get into more details around you know where you may want or expect to have HA 
either at the VM level or at the uh, at the SQL Server level. Um, but depending on your requirements, you might get a piece of feature or functionality. Like I mentioned before, you might get compression out of the underlying hyperconverged solution. Um, you might get high availability out of the virtualization layer associated with the hyperconverged solution. So that might mean I don't need Enterprise Edition for that given workload. You might need it for some, not for others. It gives you more flexibility, which ultimately can help you um, reduce cost as well. Another consideration that I mentioned is around uh, physical SQL Server. So again, with hyperconvergence, you're expecting virtualization. But a lot of these solutions can al also export physical storage from that hyperconverged storage layer or storage fabric to external servers. And this actually gives you a great bridge um, if you're physical today and you just need additional storage resources for a given SQL Server instance. And then maybe down the line, um, you might virtualize that, that instance at a later time. Or you might keep it bare metal just for the case of maintaining that existing server investment. Um, so that's one of the reasons people look at um, look at storage area networks. It gives them the ability to have compute and storage uh, separate, if you will. Like I talked about storage only with hyperconvergence, um, which helps to solve that problem. But if you have different refresh cycles, you might be going through a SAN refresh and not a server refresh, or vice versa. Um, you know, but you but you might be very interested in hyperconvergence. Look for a solution that can actually export storage to my to your physical servers if, if need be, um, and that gives you a bridge to the hyperconvergence and it allows you to um, maintain the investment that you've had in those physical servers without having to you know get rid of them because you've moved to hyperconvergence and this appliance model. So it gives you additional flexibility and investment protection. So I mentioned HA options. Um, you know, again with hyperconvergence, you can see an example here. We have multiple nodes. Uh, that uh, that are running. When you virtualize SQL Server, it's a great way to get high availability uh, for your standalone instances that were otherwise physical. And you put them in a VM. If you were to do maintenance on a node, that virtual machine would simply live migrate. Uh, if you did it preemptively or if you had a failure, um, it would just do a, a virtual machine high availability restart on one of the other nodes in the cluster. Um, so looking at hyperconvergence and looking at virtualization in general, gives you a nice means to get inherent HA that can survive server failure for SQL Server instances, really regardless of the addition, and also regardless um, of, uh, of whether or not you've implemented some high availability at the SQL Server layer. Further, however, you should be able to have flexible um, storage topologies and also flexible HA options within SQL itself. Um, so invariably, that means a couple of things. It means that you want to support failover cluster instances, or it means that you want to support always on availability groups. Um, now, given that you're working with virtualization, there could be some restrictions on how you implement failover clustering um, with that within that hypervisor. Um, if you're Hyper-V, you need something that's going to support um, shared VHDX. That's the recommended model of doing shared storage with Hyper-V. If it's uh, ESX, it's a little more restrictive. They don't have a shared virtual disk construct, so you might have to look at things like in-guest um, iSCSI or in-guest means for directly attaching to external storage. Um, so having a, an, an option to be able to do that, we found um, as a requirement for especially migrating older versions of SQL. So if you're SQL 2008, um, maybe your Enterprise Edition, you could be very well using just a simple failover cluster instance, two nodes with shared storage. And if you want to migrate that onto a hyperconverged solution and maintain that same mode, of shared storage, you need to make sure that it's um, that it's supported, and it's also something um, that's fully supported uh, with Nutanix across all the hypervisors that we support. So whether it's ESX or um, AHV, which is our hypervisor based on um, a highly modified form of KVM, or ESXi, we can offer you this kind of shared storage clustering for your virtualized SQL Server instances. And further, and I think this is a, a great mode for deploying SQL Server is the ability to really scale out um, with, with SQL. And you know, always on availability groups gives you a very, very good way to do that. So you know, you heard me talking before about, um, about data locality and really localizing workloads to the nodes that they happen to run on. Imagine, uh, imagine a primary database, excuse me, imagine a, a primary database that's running on a particular node, but you have a secondary, maybe, maybe a read-only secondary AAG running on a different node or even uh, a, you know, a third copy running on another node for, for backup offload. Um, it gives you the ability to really scale out with that hyperconverged solution 
and giving the best flexibility with respect to both HA or even disaster recovery. Some people use uh, availability groups to replicate between clusters. Um, so if you want to maintain a mode within different data centers or even in the same data center, it gives you that much more uh, capability. So this is a great mode for deploying with hyperconvergence. And obviously, that's going to depend on your licensing, licensing level or on your SQL Server version, so 2012 or higher. Um, and with SQL 2016, they've actually opened up the ability to do um, uh, a two-copy DAG with uh, standard licensing. So you know the licensing restriction that you saw with previous versions is uh, eased up a bit there to allow you to kind of dip your toes, if you will, for smaller scale AAG deployments with um, the standard edition. Again, it's a great mode for deploying with, uh, with hyperconvergence. Uh, and just real quickly, I'll, I'll end with a the quick talk around disaster recovery. So I mentioned all these unavailability groups and being able to repl replicate at the application layer, really at the SQL Server layer, to, to give you a disaster recovery solution. So replicating to a different data center, perhaps, um, whether it be synchronously or asynchronously. Um, but you have options at other layers as well. So it could be at the hypervisor layer, using something like Hyperview Replica, which has some cool functionality for replicating to Azure, for example. For example, using something like Azure Site Recovery. Um, you can use vSphere replication. I don't hear that as often. Um, but you know, if you're looking at a hyperconverged solution, does it have storage-based replication? So, for example, if I want to replicate um, maybe SQL instances that are doing distributed transactions, you're not going to be able to replicate that with always on availability groups. It's not something that's supported. Whereas a block-level solution that can replicate based on consistency groups could help you replicate that distributed transaction uh, style of environment, or help you replicate a multi-tiered application where you would have a web tier, maybe a, a data logic or, or um, a, a presentation tier, or a data tier. So a multi-tiered application where you can take all those layers, which may have remote log storage, they might have just file share storage, which is related to the, the data stored within SQL, and replicate it all together consistently. Um, so storage replication helps you do that, and having a hyperconvert solution that also does that um, is an important consideration. Further, you might choose the kind of consistency that you're doing within that replication. Um, so a common use of with SQL Server is doing something like VSS. Um, so the volume shadow copy service that um, comes inherent with Windows, also supported with the SQL Server Writer, with the ability to actually quiesce SQL for the purposes of not only creating a point in time copy, but actually creating a backup. So a backup that you can restore. You know, so does that hyperconvert solution offer you an application consistent way to take a, a database copy and associate it with, say, a, a snapshot for local protection or, or even remote disaster recovery. And like I mentioned before, consistency groups at the storage layer that helps you, pr 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 helps you protect multiple virtual machines, um, really giving you a, a, a dependent write copy, um, really a, maintaining write order fidelity, if you will, across those different instances, whether you're doing distributed transactions across databases or have a multi-tier application. It's important to make sure you have a vendor that supports that um, as well. So I know I'm, uh, I'm coming up on time for the hour. I really want to leave time for, for questions as I, as I talk through. There's other things that we can go into around management um, at the infrastructure layer. Again, hyperconvergence really helps to um, combine the roles that you might otherwise have. So awareness in the virtual machines, awareness in the storage, awareness in the networking, um, awareness into uh, all the compute utilization that you'll have. Um, so really, when you look at a hyperconverged solution, you want to make sure that the management is also making it easy for someone like a DBA to get insight, to get valuable, valuable information into how this infrastructure is being used. You shouldn't have separate management layers at the storage, at the network, at the hypervisor, at the, um, at the database layer to, to, to make it harder to really understand you know, what's, you know, what's my bottleneck, what do I need to do, how do I need to scale, you know, what do I need to... To, to grow, you know, are you giving me some level of actionable uh, forecasting at the CPU layer, at the memory layer, at the storage layer to say, hey, you're growing this environment, you're consuming more storage, you're going to run out in, in X amount of time. You know, this is one of the benefits of hyperconvergence. It's not just about, uh, you know, combining storage and, and making it simple to use. It's about taking um, all that information that you can now combine more easily and giving me something actionable. Um, to use to make make really really good business decisions and make it easier. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there. Uh, you know I have some slides on on best practices. Really these best practices apply um, across the board. You know whether whether you're using uh, you know different virtualization layers. But really most of the best practices have to do is if if I virtualize my SQL Server instance, one of the kinds of things um, that I that I need to understand or or need to assume.
but I want to re respect everyone's time um, and answer any questions that anyone might have uh, you know, throughout the chat. Uh, there is a question. Um, if you will, you know, like if you'll share the slide deck with me, and we'll put it on the past website. Would that be all right? Absolutely. Yeah, more more than happy. So again, I didn't want to make this Nutanix specific. I could talk Nutanix specific technology all day. I, re I really wanted to make it valuable for um, for you guys to to take as a baseline. Get questions in your head. You know, if you're if you're an infrastructure admin and you're focusing on storage and servers, you know, what kind of questions should I be asking? If someone comes up and says, "Hey, I've got a great hyperconverged solution for you. Um, I want you to be loaded with the right questions, especially if you're if you're looking at a mission critical uh, database environment with uh, with SQL Server. Uh, and again, the best practices are really straightforward. You can you can uh, uh, peruse them um, as we as we post the um, as we post the deck. And I'll I'll just quickly step through them, uh, you know, just visually as we uh, as we close out the call. So if someone wants to pause on the video and and take a look at our recommendations, but everyone should be pretty familiar with these kinds of infrastructure recommendations. Around uh, around using uh, you know virtualized NUMA or, or sizing a SQL instance to be within NUMA node boundaries, meaning that the memory associated with a with a given processor um, you, that'll give you the best performance. You know, distributing across multiple virtual disks, um, and also SQL specific recommendations. Um, but I really hope you guys found this chat uh, uh, useful and interesting. And uh, if you have any questions uh, going forward in this space, um, you can contact me on Twitter. So just at MCGATM. Um, you can even hit my uh, Nutanix email address if you want. But if you want to hit me quickly, hit me up on Twitter. I'd be happy to continue this conversation offline. If you need any advice, if you're uh, uh, looking at these kind of solutions, I'd be great to answer any questions. Thank you, Mike, for coming on today. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, just to let everybody know, uh, the session is recorded. I'm going to post a link. I'm going to give it to Mike, and they'll have it at the Nutanix site, too. And um, um, can't thank you enough, and hopefully we'll get you back in a month, couple months and, and give another presentation if you have some time. No, I'd appreciate that. That'd be great. You guys are you guys are um, you know a great audience, and uh, you know I think um, you know if you guys find it useful, I'd love your your feedback. If this kind of info is great, and uh, you know we can do it again. Okay. Well, I'm uh in the session. It's about that time today, and I uh, hope everybody has a great weekend coming up. And uh, thanks again for attending our uh, data architecture chapter. And um, talk to you all at the next session.